Well, I think to be effective, you've got to be, you've got to be aware of, of the real world, where it's at. And also, you've got to be aware that you've got to deal with people the way they are. You can't create people in a test tube. And basically, what sets, gets a lot of us going is we put ourselves in the place of the animal. And if I were that animal, how would I want to be treated? And that's what puts the fire in our belly. But then we also have to think, if we want to change people's behavior, if I were that person, what would make me want to change my behavior? And calling them a bunch of sadistic bastards and clobbering with a two by four isn't going to make them sit up and say, how can we be responsive to these concerns? I think there are a lot of people in the world who are trying to change it in some way for the better and are prepared to actually put some of their life into bringing about change. The problem always is how can you, as an individual activist, really make a difference? The world is so vast, so complex, sometimes you despair of making any kind of difference. I think the real lesson to be learned from what Henry has done is that you can make a difference. Yeah, I've had an empathy for animals since I've been a kid. Uh, early on, I remember having this daydream of breaking open all the bird cages and letting the birds soar free. And then later on, I remember my grandparents' home. They had this tongue hanging in the kitchen that totally grossed me out. I never ate tongue again. And I think it was just a whole series of events until somebody dumped a cat on me and I became totally bonded with this cat. Then I became uncomfortable about sticking caressing one animal and sticking a knife and fork into another. And around that time, around 1973, I came across Peter Singer's essay in the New York Review of Books, where he described a universe of billions of animals that, whose suffering was intense, expanding, and socially sanctioned. And I felt that what he was talking about is basically what I'd been into all along, to, uh, you know, basically in defense of the vulnerable, of the exploited, and the dominated. And the animals were on the bottom of the entire heap and they were unable to mobilize in defense of their own interests, so it was up to us to do it for them. In 1973, I was invited to take up a visiting assistant professorship at New York University. While I was doing that, I was asked to teach a course in continuing education for adults, not students of the university. And so I gave a series of classes um, developing the themes in animal liberation and Henry Spiro was uh, one of the students who enrolled for that course. But over the years I've worked with Henry and uh, I've come to admire and respect the way he works and, and we have become close friends. At the end of the course I said that we all know the way animals are being treated isn't right and those of you who are interested in pursuing this, not from the point of view of philosophizing, but what is it that we can do about it, let's meet in my apartment. And then about a group of about a half a dozen or eight or ten people met in my apartment for over, over an extended period of time. So we looked around and uh, we went through computer searches and we looked through the literature and we found out about this American Museum of Natural History where for a period of 20 some odd years they've been deliberately crippling cats and kittens in order to then observe their sexual performance. Uh, the reason we thought this was a good campaign was because it was a sure winner. Uh, the museum had, has to be concerned with the image it projects. Uh, people don't expect this sort of thing to be happening at the museum. You're dealing with cats and kittens who are considered part of the household. In the summer of 1975, we started off with an article in, the, in Our Town, which is a uh, New York City Manhattan weekly, and we had demonstrations every weekend for a year and a half and it varied from half a dozen people to a thousand people in a demonstration. And we had a lot of variety. We had fire trucks up there, we had celebrities out there, we had t-shirts, we had hats, we had posters. And one message that 
certainly came across the American Museum is that we weren't going to go away. We were going to stay up there until the experiments are stopped and until the, the labs are dismantled. And that's what we did. We just came down there every weekend for a year and a half. Usually the scientific community rallies very strongly around any one of its members who's attacked by animal rights activists. But in this case, the support was rather weak. Uh, one reason was that um, this was an elderly uh, scientist and uh, his uh, experiments were kind of, of marginal significance. He was studying the effect on sexual performance when he did various things to cats. And he'd made a, <clears throat> a serious strategic error in that he had named his cats after various leaders of the scientific community, including one was named after the president of the National Academy of Sciences. This word had gotten around. So when he came under attack, the usual rallying round and defense didn't take place quite as strongly as it usually did. We had asked our supporters to contact the media and tell them to tell the story of the museum. We'd asked them to contact the members of Congress. And one of the people that got really heavily involved in it was Congressman Ed Koch, who was then a congressperson from uh, Manhattan. I don't happen to like cats myself. I mean, I'm one of those people who has a phobia about cats, and I'm uncomfortable when I'm in the same room with them. I, you know, to each his own. I like dogs. So I went up to the museum. It was on a Saturday. And uh, there, in cages, uh, were perhaps uh, 100 or more cats, each in a separate cage. So I said, well, tell me what you're doing. What, what, what are you experimenting on? And she said, uh, well, we are experimenting on hyper and hypo sexuality in cats. Hyper meaning too much sexual drive, hypo uh, too little. I said, well, that's interesting. And I said, well, how do you pursue this experiment? She said, we put lesions uh, in their brains in particular uh, areas. And then we put the cat into a dark room. And in the dark room uh, is a uh, paper mache cat, a rabbit, female, and a uh, female real live cat. And then what, said I, and the person said, if the cat is hyper, it will mount the rabbit. So I was a little stunned by this. So I said, well, well tell me something. I said, uh, you take these cats and you put lesions in their brains, and after you have this deranged male cat with two holes in its brain, and you throw it into a dark room, and it mounts a rabbit? Yes. I said, well, how does the rabbit feel about this? And then I said, well, after you do this, this deranged cat in this dark room, mounts the rabbit, what do you got? Silence. And then I said, how long have you been doing this? And she said, 20 years. After Koch visited the museum and talked to the experimenters up there, he related his experiences to the members of Congress with a great deal of sarcasm and a great deal of wit. And that generated, like, a lot of support to stop, the, to stop these experiments. There was 121 members of Congress questioned the National Institutes of Health about what the hell was going on up there. And the result is that the pressure just kept on mounting and increasing, and then the National Institutes of Health stopped funding the uh, the experiment in the American Museum of Natural History, which caused them to stop the entire thing and dismantle the labs, and that was the end of that. He not only mobilized uh, considerable local activism, but he got the attention of the scientific community. I mean, the significant issue was uh, uh, Nicholas Wade's article in Science Magazine that uh, established that this was a protest with some legitimacy and some credibility. I think Henry saw the article as a considerable vindication because the magazine I was working for is a sort of you know, regarded as a as an organ of the scientific community. Um, 
we reporters didn't regard it as that way. We, we, we tried to be as independent as we could. But from the outside, at least, it looked like we'd given our endorsement to, to Henry's side of the issue simply because we hadn't come out as strongly in favor of the scientists as he had expected. When actually those experiments stopped, I thought this is a tremendous breakthrough for the whole idea of animal liberation because now it's not going to be possible to dismiss the movement as, as a bunch of, of cranks or people who are just ineffective. Now people can see how pointless and cruel some of the experiments that are conducted on animals are to the point that um, they're going to have a look at the whole question of how we treat animals in a different light. Well, scientists have been using animals to experiment on in order to discover things about the nature of our physiology for hundreds of years. But it was very, very small numbers. In the 19th century, um, in Britain, for example, they were doing about 400 experiments a year. In the 20th century, corporations began to use animals very standardly just to develop new products. They would put things into the eyes of rabbits, uh, shampoos or other uh, cosmetics. They would force feed uh, rats and mice and dogs with any substance that might conceivably be ingested, whether it was a food colouring or uh, a washing powder or whatever it was. So that in the United States, the numbers of animals being used each year uh, rose into the tens of millions. Um, maybe 20, 30, 40 million animals were being used in testing. And this was an enormous uh, amount of suffering that was going on. But the uh, whole animal movement and the anti-vivisection movement seemed just powerless to do anything to stop these companies. Yeah, what bothered me about the anti-vivisection movement was that basically all their activity consisted of collecting atrocity stories sending these atrocity stories out to their members and their supporters and asking them to send them money so that the following month they could send them more atrocity stories and ask them for more money and the whole thing just didn't make any sense. The point isn't to get people upset about atrocities but to get people fired up so that they do something about it so that there's an end result that reduces the total amount of animal suffering. I was born in uh, 1927 in Antwerp, Belgium, into a dysfunctional family. And uh, when I was nine years old, I was shipped out to live with some relatives. Uh, I lived in England, lived in Germany for a while. And then when I was 11, the family reunited in Panama. And when I was 13, I moved to New York. Well, my father, after a while, made out pretty well in New York in the industrial diamond business, and he became rather, became somewhat affluent and got a house out in uh, Mount Vernon in the suburbs. Uh, he just felt that I needed to reflect his value systems, and it just didn't work. You know, I was reading leftist stuff, and uh, he was trying to become affluent, and uh, at the age of 16, I just left home. I just figured that I'm better off on my own. So I went to school in the morning, worked in the afternoon, supported myself, and then next, the following year when I was 17, I went on the merchant ships. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of reasons why I joined the merchant ships. Uh, one of them is just the adventure, wanting to see the world, wanting to see what's outside of where I've been. Uh, but also it was a hotbed of militant trade union activism, and I was interested in trade union activity. And it just seemed to me that uh, it had all the elements of everything I wanted to do at that point. And I was footloose and I wasn't grounded any place. And it was just the ideal thing to expand one's horizons. Oh, I had a glowing dream of how fair the world would seem. Each man would live his life secure and free. When the world is owned by labor and there's truth and peace for all. In that commonwealth of toil that is to be, I'll abide. Oh, God.
Henry was pretty unique in the Socialist Workers Party, where everybody was supposed to be quite disciplined. And Henry was never very disciplined at all. He did what he wanted to do, and was always in a good cause, and people would approve of it. But there were a lot of people who sort of took a dim view of that kind of behavior. Uh, in 1951, the uh, U.S. Coast Guard screened me off the ships because they felt that my continued presence would be inimical to the security of the United States government. And then I was drafted into the U.S. Army. I was shipped off to Berlin, and my job was to indoctrinate the American troops about the American way of life. And here you got the incongruity of one arm of the government considers me subversive, and the other one has me indoctrinating them. When I left the Army, I got a job at General Motors Automobile Assembly Plant in uh, Linden, New Jersey. And there was this uh, Hungarian fellow who worked there, and he was real popular with his mates. And when there was a big problem up there, he just laid down his tools, got the rest of the people in the body shop to lay down their tools, and was able to close down the entire plant. Uh, and he didn't even attend trade union meetings because he figured they were beside the point. And it showed you the power of uh, what one person can do who's in sync with the, uh, with the rest of the people. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Henry went to the South, as a matter of fact, and wrote articles about the civil rights movement as he saw it. He would go to the scene of whatever was going on and write about them in words and language that people could understand. There was no jargon, no abstraction. He just wrote it and was able to move people on that basis. He told me at one time, that the main reason he was in the Socialist Workers' Party was to have an outlet for the things he wanted to write. He wanted the news to get out, and obviously the kind of things he wrote wouldn't be published in a major newspaper like the Daily News. In this, this is February 1959, and that's one of the articles on the FBI of the series. There were 10... In the 1950s, uh, Hoover was, was considered sacrosanct, a few steps above God and everybody genuflected and everybody was scared to death of J. Edgar Hoover and his shadow. And uh, I just figured that being that J. Edgar Hoover was checking up on everybody, it'd be kind of interesting to check up on J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. And he went to Washington, D.C. and got a ticket to be tourist and be guided through the FBI, which I suppose after a while people got a little nervous about, that is the people who worked there. And, uh, he wrote this wonderful series of articles exposing the FBI for what it was, as being racist, as being anti-union, as, as being in league with strike breakers, with the Klan, and so on. It's a great series. What motivated you to go down to Cuba? That is, I think at that time the SWP really took a dim view of the whole thing, and it must have been an undisciplined act on your part. I don't think I asked anybody, as best I can remember. <laughs> Naturally, uh, it was just, uh, you know, there had been a revolution in Cuba. I'd read some stuff about it, and I just wanted to figure, hey, you know, I'd like to see for myself, see what's going on down there. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got down there, like, I was immediately impressed. He traveled throughout Cuba and watched people's reactions to what was being done. Everything changed. Everything was now in the context of what was good for the people, not what was good for the leader. Because people did see what was happening in Cuba, to some extent because of articles like Henry's, a whole generation of youth became radicalized. There was hope. If they could do it in Cuba, maybe we could do it also. Uh, 
Uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, I was the volunteer editor of the call for National Maritime Union Democracy. And the problem was that for 36 years, Joseph Kern was the one and only president of the Maritime Union. And he began to use the union as a trough to enrich himself and not take care of the needs of the merchant seamen. And it was an organization of an insurgent movement, and I became heavily involved in it. Jim Morrissey, who was uh, a vocal opponent of the Joseph Curran machine, got his head cracked with lead pipes in front of the Union Hall while he was distributing material. And what this insurgent group did, basically, was demand the right of free elections, and that it's not a matter of democracy in the Union for its own sake, but if you don't have democracy, then you can't have the interests of the seamen being represented by the Union. Uh, some of the lessons I learned through the Maritime Union campaign is that a multi-million dollar apparatus can be challenged by a handful of people if the apparatus is out of sync with its membership. And the other things I learned is that in order to be effective, you've got to speak the language of the people you're working with. Late in 1978, Henry came to me and said, uh, um, I'd like to do a campaign. You know, the uh, American Museum campaign had sort of wound down at that point in time, and so he was looking on to the next campaign. What did I suggest he should do? We spent some time together, and I suggested the Dray's test. We had heard about the Dray's test, which is basically placing any kind of chemical in the eye of a rabbit to see how much damage it does to the eyes of this conscious rabbit. And this fellow Smythe in Britain from the Research Defense Society had suggested that this was a good test to find an alternative to. So we had support from within the science community already that an alternative would be possible. Uh, we scouted around and we figured that our best focus for this uh, would be uh, the cosmetics industry, which was using the Dray's test. And in that connection, we could juxtapose the dream of beauty that they were fashioning with the reality nightmare of the rabbits. We wanted a sharp focus, and we figured that when people think of the cosmetics industry, first thing they think of is Revlon. Revlon is basically a symbol of the industry. And if you're the leader of the industry, you've got to set the course. Well, we sent a letter to Michel Bergerac, president of uh, Revlon, and uh, they pushed it off onto Frank Johnson, who was the director of uh, public affairs. And we presented him with a paper about Revlon funding research to develop alternatives to Dre's rabbit eye test. And after a number of months of talking to the guy, of chatting to him, uh, he still hadn't passed it on to his science advisors, in which case we figured that they weren't really being serious about it. The cosmetic industry is basically into marketing, and in order for us to fight the cosmetics industry, we needed to do it as well as they do. And we hooked up with uh, Mark Graham, an advertising executive. I had the feeling that uh, even with this powerful coalition which Henry had put together, that one needed to communicate the bigness and the sophistication and, and all those things um, through an ad that looked like it was put out by a big organization. I knew the stock was going down that day, but more importantly, I knew the company had a very significant problem that could cut not just to one day stock price trading, but could cut to the core of the company. And in fact, if it weren't really well handled and so forth, it would have such a deleterious effect that it could theoretically wipe Revlon off the, uh, off the face of the uh, counter in drugstores and department stores. Most people believe that rabbits are voiceless. Wrong! The demonstration Wrong! featured a piece of street theater, and protesters dressed up in rabbit costumes brought along some live bunnies to help make their point. They want Revlon to stop using rabbits to test its products for eye irritancy. Henry Spira, a high school English teacher, organized the protest. He says he's pointing the finger at Revlon because they are the leaders in the industry. 
But we're trying to tell Revlon that the people are not going to stand still for the blinding of Revlon, for the blinding of rabbits for the sake of another mascara, for the sake of another shampoo. And we're telling them that we want to, with a sense of urgency, want them to start developing immediately other non-animal methods for testing. Revlon, stop! Stop! Torturing animals! Well, I think that the thing that was interesting to me as a business reporter uh, for Henry's handling of the Revlon campaign was that uh, he was willing to take on a really big name public target there. For most of the movement, that would have been a real unknown quantity and something that would have been very dangerous. Henry realized that it was a big institution that had interests. And if you could identify what those interests were and find some little area of overlap between their interests and your interests, you could actually accomplish something. I remember one day at lunchtime an enormous demonstration on the Fifth Avenue side of the General Motors building and there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who Henry introduced to us who carried big signs and who were picketing our company and what really made, showed me just how effective Henry Spira is and was is that in the middle of that was every major science writer, science reporter, newspaper man, TV science person, and that evening on the news and the next morning's newspapers, we took a beating up the likes of which no opponent of Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali ever took. In any business, when you're dealing with people who have uh, values or an agenda that's different from yours, it starts to feel like blackmail. They want to know if we reach some kind of agreement, is this the end of it? Or is this just the first step and is there gonna be more and more and more? If so, uh, what are we letting ourselves in for? So an, an important element of this campaign from, from Revlon's point of view is, is there something we can do that will put us on a common footing that will make the problem go away or contain it or at least put it on some course where everybody knows what's gonna happen and we can plan for it? And uh, that was one of the great uncertainties here because this had never been achieved between any piece of the animal rights movement and any company that they had spoken with. Ultimately, what Revlon did was they pushed $750,000 into Rockefeller University for Rockefeller to develop alternatives to the Dre's rabbit, rabbit eye test. And what that did, in effect, was it, it, for the first time, legitimized and institutionalized the search for alternatives. Not only was that a hugely singular triumph for Henry Spira, but more importantly, it opened up an entire era of cooperation between the so-called business community and the animal rights group. What was interesting is when I started doing some work at the uh, Columbia Business School, I uh, dealt with this professor who asked me, you know, what was my background and why was I interested in what I was doing there. And uh, he said, well, one of my best and most popular cases is the Revlon case with Henry Spira. Because, I mean, that is now a classic uh, negotiating technique that will be taught at that school forever, I hope. After Revlon came across with $750,000 for alternatives, uh, we sent a letter off to uh, Avon and said that they were the, the other flagship in the industry and that they could do no less than Revlon did. And being that they were aware of the ads that we had done on Revlon, they were real quick in responding and they pushed $750,000 towards alternatives, some of which money went to Johns Hopkins to set up the Center for Alternatives. Good morning, Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing. The center was formed 15 years ago uh, to develop in vitro and other alternative methods to 
help the risk assessor, the federal and other regulatory agencies, to use non-animal methods in the risk assessment process. We are trying to protect human health. We're trying to improve that which we can for animal welfare. But we understand the necessity to use animals to continue to develop the biological base that will allow us to eliminate their use eventually. That first meeting was uh, a little painful because uh, Henry decided he was going to tell me how to run the center. And as Henry found out during that meeting that I had very strong opinions of how that center was going to run, that science was going to be the driving force, and uh, it was not going to be a, a show in PR, but it was going to be a very active activity, but based on basic scientific principles. At this point in time, I've learned to have Henry work with me and think through some of the issues, to try to look at where are the next stages in development, what are the issues that are important, um, how do we marshal the resources that are necessary. Um, and Henry has been a, uh, a very insightful uh, thinker and, strate and strategic planner. Yeah, Peter, I thought this might interest you. These are our shares of stock. This is our portfolio. This is how we gain access to the movers and shakers and major corporations. One share of stock makes it possible for us to attend and speak at, use a mic, meet the chief executive officer at the annual shareholders meeting. Right. So you can, you just have to buy one share and you can ask questions. And you can, you can oh, attend yeah. and you can ask questions. Right. And you know damn well that the chief executive officer knows about your concern. Procter and Gamble. Oh, so that's what got you into the meeting where you got me into the meeting of yeah. the of one of the major household companies in the world. Well, another industry that was projecting an image and you know, that had to be conscious of its image and of its reputation is a whole household industry, and the biggest one there is Procter and Gamble. So we contacted Procter and Gamble, and being that they had, it's it's like an enormous corporation that rather than getting them to push money out outside, that they use their own internal experience and resources to develop alternatives and to publicize those alternatives that they've developed. And that's what we try to get them to do. And when they were non-responsive, I went to a shareholders meeting. And everybody up there is all dressed up. And I came there, a pair of open sneakers and a t-shirt and a pair of khakis. And um, you know, basically, I asked the questions that I had asked in my letters about that hey, you're leading you're leading household products companies and you've got an obligation to promote alternatives and what are you doing? And uh, the chair hadn't really been prepared for this question and basically I spent like a lot of time preparing and prepping the uh, CEO for questions that might be raised at the uh, stockholders meeting and he didn't know where he, where he was coming or he was going and I was pulling out documents from my back pocket and at the wind up was that he set up a meeting with decision makers for us to be able to discuss the issue later on. Roberts, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Henry is not out for a show. He's not trying to, to get the attention on himself. He really wants to see change. And uh, he's very reasonable. I, I think one reason he's effective is that he's reasonable. He doesn't expect people to change overnight. And he rewards small steps, whereas some animal rights groups think it should be all or nothing. You know, looking back, all the successes that happened in the lab animal scene amount, amount to a mere drop in a bucket when compared with the seven billion farm animals that suffer from birth to slaughter. Over the last few decades, the traditional farm has virtually disappeared. The animals that used to be out in the fields eating grass, uh, the hens that used to be scratching in the farmyard, they've gone inside. 
these days you've got factory farms. Uh, you've got tens of thousands of uh, chicks in, in, one, in one big uh, dark hangar. And uh, basically they just step over their own uh, ammonia and their own uh, feces. And they never have a good day. They don't see the sunlight. Uh, they can't stretch their wings. They can't, they can't do any, any, any one of their natural instincts. That they're all thwarted. And you've got uh, calves and crates where they can't turn around. You've got gestation crates for hogs where, they, where basically they're imprisoned in iron frames throughout their entire lives. Uh, and the other thing, obviously, is that if animals live this kind of a sickly existence, that uh, the meat is not going to be healthy either. The animal movement has not really done enough to tell people about this, to, to let people know that the neatly packaged pieces of uh, meat or, or eggs that come out of the supermarket have come from animals who are leading basically miserable lives throughout their entire lives. Yeah, the first campaign was uh, focused on uh, Frank Perdue, who was basically the chicken mogul of the eastern seaboard of the United States. You know, ideally we thought that he would play the same role as Revlon did, that we would contact him and that uh, he would set up a center for farm animal uh, well-being at the University of Maryland, which he was associated with in any case. Uh, so we tried to dialogue with him uh, for a couple of years and they never responded. And that's when we started doing our negative advertising campaign on Frank Perdue. In many ways, Perdue was uh, uh, an even more ideal target than, than, than Revlon because he was just such a, a, a bad news personality. Yeah, Frank Perdue was just bad news all the way around. He was bad news for the chickens. He was bad news for the environment. He was bad news as far as, work, as worker safety was concerned. There was a lot of sexual harassment in this plant. He, he explo exploited the hell out of minority women. And every which way you looked at Frank Perdue was just nothing but bad news. My Purdue chickens turn out gold and yellow because I give them an expensive diet that includes these wholesome yellow foods. He was a poultry mogul who looked and talked like his product. And an advertising agency, one of the best in the United States at that time, had seized on that and made him the stand-up persona for his product. And what he did for a lot of years was to talk about the pampered life that these animals um, lived before they arrived on your dinner table. A chicken is what it eats, and my chickens eat better than people do. Well, we figured that the best strategy to use in connection with Purdue was the strategy of self-interest of the consumer, uh, that there was a danger in, uh, in the chickens from the point of view of Salmonella and E. coli. Um, and we figured that the symbol for for protecting people from sa for safety's sake was a condom. Well, we're looking for a, a condom in which you can place a Frank Purdue chicken. So we went to some of the places in Greenwich Village and asked them for the biggest condom that they had. And people look at you sort of on the odd side. Uh, and we said, well, we needed to put a chicken inside. And they looked at you even odder. In fact, we were able to get something that could accommodate a fairly large Purdue bird. and. Uh, bring it back to the studio and uh, after a while we, after breaking a, a lot of condoms, we finally got the picture we needed. Well, after we did our full page ads in the New York Times, there was a lot of media response, not so much to the chickens as to the issue of worker safety. A number of programs appeared in connection with that. And what the campaign did for us is that it created a calling card for us in the sense that when we approached other companies like McDonald's or like the uh, Shackley and Hoisting Outfits, that they could see that uh, the options are either to dialogue with us or to have a campaign like the Purdue campaign mounted on them. The uh, face branding campaign points out the importance of keeping one's, one's antennas up. There was a minor item in the Federal Register that said that the U.S. Department of Agriculture was going to expand their, their program of face branding cattle being imported from Mexico. And we felt that this was a good opportunity to revisit the whole issue and challenge it uh, because uh, it's kind of easy to make the public identify with having a hot iron brand being pushed on one's jaw. This is crude and it's way above and beyond what the public would accept. Well, the reason they were doing the face branding, it was a uh, you know, way to mark cattle uh, you know, for 
disease regulatory purposes. And, you know, there's other places you can brand cattle besides on the face. I mean, you can do it back on the rear end. We attempted to have a dialogue with the people at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They set up a meeting. They canceled the meeting, at which point we, f we figured that with 30,000 uh, animals getting their faces uh, scorched each day, uh, this lackadaisical attitude isn't appropriate. Uh, so we got two people to go down to Mexico to actually get these photographs of the of face branding in progress so the public could see and feel the terror on the faces of these animals as the hot iron poker is being pushed into their jaw. We were able, in fact, to get sequence photography. It shows an animal with the iron initially on the face and then how the cloud of smoke grows as its face almost bursts into flame. And using that, we was able to put together an ad uh, which headlines, uh, this is what USDA policy looks like. Can you imagine what it feels like? There were a thousand people contacted the Secretary of Agriculture the first day after the ads appeared. And later on, 12,000 people wrote to the U.S. Department of Agriculture commenting on it. And when the U.S. Department of Agriculture saw the public response, they became enormously responsive. And not only did they stop the expansion, but they also stopped the entire program of face branding. The importance of, of Henry's campaign about face branding is that he turned around the entire United States Department of Agriculture. That's a bit like turning a super tanker. Uh, it's a huge entity, and to get it to admit that it was wrong in what it was doing, and in the process to acknowledge that it had to take on board animal welfare as a factor in its policies, was really an enormous victory. Uh, one of the practices that has most outraged animal protectionists has been the shackling and hoisting of conscious animals. Basically, you wrap a chain around one leg of a cow or cattle and hoist them up in the air while they're still alive and they're thrashing, and then you slit their throat. And uh, the Temple of Grandin had developed an alternative, what they call a double restrainer system, where the animal will still be conscious but not be turned upside down, hanging. And we suggest to these companies that there's no viable alternative and that they move towards a viable alternative. Well, an animal weighs 1,200 pounds, and if you weighed 1,200 pounds, I don't think a chain around your ankle lifting you up in the air by one leg would feel very good. These cattle uh, bellow uh, tremendously when you do this and, you know, show obvious signs of pain and suffering when they're hung upside down. And the heavier the animal is, the worse it is. And shackling and hoisting is not part of the actual, you know, ritual slaughter. Shackling and hoisting is something that a plant does because they just don't want to spend the money to put in a proper uh, upright uh, restraining chute. And there had been a lot of campaigns and they went nowhere. And one, uh, one possible reason why they went nowhere is because these slaughterhouses are really not concerned about the image that they project. Uh, so what we did is that we went to some of their corporate uh, uh, customers uh, and use that, as, uh, use that as leverage on the slaughterhouses. And I think there was no doubt in the minds of those people that were involved that they could become the next Frank Perdue in the press and, and all the spin-off journalism. The first one that we contacted was Morrell because the, the chief executive officer had a good track record on worker safety and we figured if he was responsive to that, he might be responsive to this as well and kind of worked out real well. Uh, and they just uh, went right into an upright restrainer system where the animal doesn't get turned upside down before, before ritual slaughter. Uh, but then the others gave us, started giving us a hard time, and we did go to their corporate uh, customers and uh, pressurized them, and they realized that uh, this is something that they did they not want the public to get involved in. And uh, we just knocked them off one after the other. Uh, early this year, I uh, found out that I had esophageal cancer and I had a major operation. Uh, and then when I got out of the operation, I basically just resumed, resumed my work uh, as I had before. I figured there's no point in worrying about cancer. I'll do whatever it's going to do, and I've got work to do. And uh, the work's been proceeding. We were looking not so much just to raise awareness 
but to make a difference, to make something happen that's going to have an impact. We've always been sensitive to the fact that uh, there are other issues besides uh, animal welfare issues. In some of our ads, uh, we focused on sexual harassment, we focused on worker safety, we focused on uh, protecting the environment, uh, we focused on feeding the billions. But it occurred to us that joining forces with these other concerns could have a bigger impact than each one of us working independently. And we approached the folks at uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health and had discussions with them about the possibility of having a, a center for a sustainable future. We're attempting to bring together information from population, nutrition, environment, uh, a variety of scientific disciplines to figure out how we can frame the big questions so that we can then influence policymakers and our entry point is this connection between factory farming and its effects on animals and the environment, human nutrition and its effect on human health, and the changes in human nutrition that we see going on around the world that are just not sustainable. Well, I think one way of looking at it is what uh, the saying of the uh, Native Americans, that what they're concerned about is the impact of what's being of what's happening, not for the current generation or the next generation, but the seventh generation from now. Last year, the American Association for the Advancement of Science had a group of experts uh, discussing where we're going into the future. And they just said that with the population explosion and the dwindling uh, water reserves and what the current methods of agriculture are doing to the land, that we wouldn't be able to sustain current methods of animal protein consumption into the next century. And the point is that these experts themselves realize that intensive confinement animal agriculture meshed with a population explosion, meshed with the fact that these emerging consumer countries are now moving from a grain, grain and, and vegetable-based diet to an animal protein diet that the planet can't sustain it. So there's got to be change. And all that we're saying is let's do it earlier rather than later. Despite Henry's poor health, he has been a wonderful friend in the short time I've known him, very supportive of the work of the center, and a, an urgency about the pace at which we're doing things that may in fact uh, come from the fact that he knows he has uh, cancer and that he may not be with us much longer. You know, I guess basically one wants to feel that one's life is amounted to more than consuming products and generating garbage. And I think one likes to be able to look back and say that, hey, one's done the best one can to make this a better place for others. And one can look at it from the point of view of what greater motivation can there be in, in a person's life than do everything one possibly can to reduce pain and suffering. I think the key, the key ingredient of a successful activist is that an activist goes beyond words into results, that they're results oriented, that you stay, that you stay in touch with reality, uh, that, that you take on an issue that's significant, that's going to make a difference, that hopefully is going to have ripple effects, and that there's a bottom line, that, it's, that you set out to achieve something and you achieve it, and you put closure on it. The whole forward thrust, the movement Henry's created, uh, rests on his shoulders, and if Henry disappears tomorrow, uh, there's an interesting question as to how much of it will survive, uh, how much will be nipped in the bud, how much would be lost by there not being some mechanism in place for someone else to pick up that mantle. In the time that I've talked to Henry, he had never really come to grips with the issue of uh, who was going to carry on in his footsteps and, and continue fighting the fight the way he fought it. <laughs> Henry has shown us that one person can make a difference, that you don't need a huge amount of resources or a big organisation behind you, but that if you think carefully and strategically enough, you can get large corporations or government departments to really change their behaviour in a progressive direction.
as a child in the 1930s, I spent a couple of years in Germany, and I could see things brewing up. Uh, later on, reflecting on the Holocaust, it occurred to me that a great many people were saying the right things, having the right thoughts, making the right noises, and doing absolutely nothing about it, similar to our currently politically correct do-nothings. And I think it made a big impact on me that one needs to focus on the bottom line. There's not enough to shout and to yell. One needs to affect change, and one needs to do it in the most effective way possible. And that one needs to make an impact on the whole situation, not just holler and shout and scream and cry.